The history of Butte, Montana is embroiled in conflict. What began as a series of mining camps in the 1870s would eventually become one of the world's largest producers of copper, and would play host to one of the most important labor disputes in American history. Butte miners would set a precedent for industrial workers nationwide as they struggled for decent wages, dignity, and safety in dangerous conditions. In 1893, Butte played a major role in forming the Western Federation of Miners, a radical labor union that organized workers throughout the Western United States, as well as British Columbia. Locally, the branch of the Western Federation of Miners that united Butte miners was called the Butte Miners Union. By 1900, 34 different unions advocated for nearly 18,000 workers in various trades. This set an example of union organizing for decades to come. This solidarity would not last, however. The unions would eventually become vulnerable as they fought amongst themselves to decide who would represent the miners. Different factions emerged. Conservatives, socialists, and the industrial workers of the world struggled for legitimacy with the locals. Ethnic differences between miners further weakened the unions. The infighting left the unions disorganized and vulnerable to mining companies that wanted only their dissolution. In the beginning, unions worked closely with the mine owners. There was healthy competition between mine owners, who fought amongst themselves for power, prestige, and allegiance from the miners. This began to change as ownership of the mines in the area began to be consolidated into the hands of less and less owners. In 1899, Standard Oil bought the interests of the previous mine owners, uniting them under the Amalgamated Copper Company, which came to simply be known as The Company. In 1912, the company fired 500 of its miners that it deemed socialist. Then, that December, they imposed a blacklist system. Miners were required to answer questions about their union and political affiliations. Those deemed agitators were simply not called for work. Throughout its ownership, the company also hired detectives from the infamous Pinkerton and Thiel detective agencies, who were tasked with infiltrating unions, identifying troublemakers, and even inciting violence and conflict from within. Mistrust and frustration reached a boiling point in June 1914. Miners were still being paid $3.50 a day, the same wage they had received in 1878, despite the fact that copper had doubled in price since then. By then, the unions were weaker than ever, doing nothing to halt the oppression from the company. This included the Western Federation of Miners, which had been so strong only 21 years ago. On the annual celebration of Miners' Union Day, June 13, 1914, an angry crowd ransacked the Miners' Union Hall after their own parade erupted into a riot. When the acting mayor, Alderman Frank Curran, appeared in the Union Hall window to plead for calm, he was told to go to hell and then pushed out of the second-story window. Any chance for peace followed him out that window. The mob stormed the building and removed the Union safe, blowing it open with dynamite. Ten days later, Charles Moyer, president of the Western Federation of Miners, came to Butte to attempt to mediate the conflict at the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Union. The meeting drew serious contention. A mob formed outside of the meeting hall. Shots were fired, killing one bystander. Union officers vacated the hall, escaping from the frenzied miners. Disgruntled workers left the riot to retrieve dynamite from the mines and came back with plenty. Using 27 sticks of dynamite, they destroyed the miners' union hall. Later that summer, the company took advantage of the chaos and dissatisfaction to announce that they would no longer recognize the legitimacy of the Western Federation of Miners. The era of closed shop had ended. Safety conditions continued to be poor, especially without strong union representation. On June 8, 1917, a group of men were trapped underground in Granite Mountain Mine, dying to fire and asphyxiation from smoke. 168 miners perished in the accident. Three days later, a general strike erupted in Butte, with workers demanding better safety regulations. Still, the company refused to yield. The Industrial Workers of the World, or IWW, tried to make progress in reorganizing Butte's unions, but largely failed in their efforts. In 1920, on April 21st, an IWW organized strike was suddenly, violently ended when gunfire erupted at a picket at the Never Sweat Mine on Anaconda Road. Company security guards had opened fire, wounding 15. Two died from their wounds. Despite the company's fault in the matter, 
they blamed the IWW for the violence. Federal troops arrived the next day to impose martial law and end the strike. Soon after, the company banned all members of the IWW from working in their mines. It was not until much later, in the 1930s, that the unions would once again begin to emerge and gain traction to fight for the miners' rights. From rise to fall, Butte's history tells a fascinating tale of workers' rights and human struggle. Though Butte's glory days are long since gone, the many conflicts that took place there have left a legacy that endures in both modern policy and in public memory.